I'm Dr. Pichon. I'm an epileptologist at Loma Linda University. I'm a pediatric um, neurologist as well. So my topic today is about electrical status epilepticus in sleep or ESES. And our objectives is to define what that is and also to define the associated syndrome called continuous spike in waves during sleep or CSWS. And I would like to discuss the epidemiology of this, the EEG pattern, the evolution, the outcome, and management of the continuous spike in waves during sleep. So it's I think it is more commonly known as ESES. That's a pattern on the EEG. And then what you see or what you diagnose the child with would be the CSWS. So EEG pattern, um, there is marked sleep potentiation. What that means is that you see these continuous spike in waves um, as when the child falls asleep. And also you see this when the child um, transitions from being awake to falling asleep. It's near continuous bilateral, meaning coming from both sides of the hemispheres, or sometimes it's just one side of the hemisphere. And you see the slow spikes and waves and they occupy most of the, what we call non-REM sleep. So, so that's a stage in sleep. As soon as you fall asleep, you get into the non-REM sleep, and then you get into different um, stages of sleep. So the, it is a spectrum. So ESES, it could be, you see here on the left, um, it's benign focal epilepsy syndromes. So what benign means is that um, the child does not, may not have any cognitive um, delays, may not have behavioral problems, and we classify them under benign. And then you have the landau Kleffner in the middle, which is um, they, the child usually has this aphasia. What we mean by that is they have this language regression. So for instance, they know how to say words, they know how to form sentences, make phrases, and then all of a sudden, boom, they lose all of that ability. That's the landau Kleffner. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the CSWS, and this, it's, very severe also. So they have the regression and then they can have the behavioral problems. And when you put an EEG um, recording on them, you see this continuous spike in waves as soon as they fall asleep. So um, continuous spike in waves during sleep is defined as epileptic encephalopathy with global regression <clears throat> or developmental regression in at least two domains of development. So what that means, global, um, so there may be a regression in language, expressive and receptive language. <clears throat> expressive meaning um, when they try to talk to you, they may have a hard time getting the words out. Receptive, if you talk to them, they may not understand completely what you're telling them. And then it may be difficult to control the seizures. And interictal epileptiform activity, that means the epileptiform abnormalities on the EEG in between seizures, um, they become more prominent during sleep. And then they become more, so they will occupy 20% of um, the, what we call the epoch, let's say, for 20 minutes and then they'll occupy 50% and then 85% as they go into deeper, more, the longer they go on the non-REM sleep. And the in, this interictal pattern may persist even after um, their clinical seizures stop because sometimes these children do have clinical seizures during the day as well. And then you will see this neurocognitive regression, which is what I explained, they're able to do things um, and then they're 
they can't anymore. So most of the complaints that I get from parents is that the teacher um, would be telling the parents that their child is not at par to where they were before. Or when the, when the child does homework, um, nothing seems to get in or the child is not able to do the homework that the child used to be able to do. <clears throat> CSWS occurs only in children and adolescents. In an outpatient pediatric series, they found that one out of 440, which is about 0.2% of children with epilepsy also had CSWS. So you can have epilepsy, they have clinical seizures, and then when they fall asleep, they have this ESES pattern in their sleep. In tertiary pediatric epilepsy centers, so um, the big centers that, for example, do <clears throat> epilepsy surgeries, um, Loma Linda is one in Southern California, and then we have UCLA, um, CHLA, Chalk, and Radies, around 0.5% to 0.6% of patients presented with um, CSWS. So it's pretty, it's it's three times than when you just look at a cohort of children with epilepsy if you go to the referral centers. And that makes sense because probably the ones that are referred to the um, epilepsy centers have very difficult to, con to control seizures and their EEG is just abnormal, um, especially when they fall asleep. And in a large case series and reviews, Male to female ratio is four to three to three to two. So most in CSWS, the males have there are it's more common um, to find it in male patients. And then for seizures, um, there are sometimes they can they may not have seizures during the day. But then when they fall asleep, they have this ESES pattern in their sleep. Or some children can have moderately abnormal development as well. Usually the children with CSWS present with seizures between two to four years old. And then patients with structural lesions, so abnormalities in the brain, they tend to have seizures earlier. So they can um, have it prior to two years old. And so CSWS is a spectrum. It's also, it also occurs in stages. So there's what we call the prodromal stage where seizures occur out of sleep and frequently they're tonic-clonic. So tonic, they stiffen, and then clonic, they start shaking. Um, unilateral seizures, usually coming from one side, that rarely progress to unilateral status epilepticus. So this is the early stage. And then in the acute stage, so sometimes they can present with other types of seizures. One is atonic. Usually that's when they lose tone and they fall to the ground. Or they can have atypical absence. So staring, and usually these are longer than your typical absence. So usually longer than 30 seconds. And then they can also have absence status epilepticus. So they're staring for a long time and without return to their baseline. So as I mentioned, seizures around two to four years old, regression occurs around five to six years old. So notice the difference. They start having seizures at two, and then about three years later, or two to three years later, you can see the regression already. So we have that window between two to three years to intervene if we see this pattern, and then perhaps slow down the regression. And they're usually accompanied by subacute worsening of EEG abnormalities and seizures. And they can resolve, um, the seizures can resolve between six to nine years old. However, if they have been seizing since between two to four years old, 
by the time they're six to nine years old, you would have seen the regression already or the cognitive deficits, the difficulty learning, the behavior problems. And these are usually not reversible once they get to that point where the EEG abnormalities have kind of um, normalized a little bit or the seizures have resolved. So you cannot reverse um, the cognitive loss. During wakefulness, focal multifocal spikes, which increase in frequency during the acute stage. So this is the EEG pattern. And then ESES, I'll show you a picture of the EEG. And then the epileptiform discharges also, um, it's like turning on a switch. As soon as the child falls asleep, then you see these spike in waves. They, you can have continuous bilateral or occasionally lateralized slow spike wound waves, which occur during a significant portion of non-REM sleep. And then the thresholds. So epileptologists typically, we give a spike wave index, a grade of how often we see the spike waves in a certain epoch or a certain amount of time during non-REM sleep. And it can range from 25% to 85%. Some authors think that the 50% is the threshold for you to call it ESES. And if there are symptoms associated with it, then you call it CSWS. So 50% to 85%. I think some authors are more conservative and they start at 25% because they want to intervene sooner. So Quantification, this is, I think this is mainly for the epileptologists or people who are reading the EEGs. You can do a spike wave index, you can do a spike wave percentage, you can do a spike frequency. So it doesn't matter how you measure it, but you should have a quantifiable number that people who read the EEGs in the future and compare it, they can compare it they can compare what they see now to what was the spike wave index before. So this is an example of, a, of ESES. You could see the spike, slow waves, spike, slow waves, spike, slow waves, spike, slow waves. So it's, it's present pretty much in every um, second. So one box here is one second. You see the spike wave in every second. And then, as I mentioned before, you have this clinical evolution. So in sleep, ESES progressively resolves. Um, as we talk, talked about between eight to nine years old, but then sometimes the interictal epileptiform discharges um, may persist for some patients, but they also eventually resolve. And then seizure freedom around eight to nine years old. But um, sometimes you still have these epileptiform discharges. So these discharges, even if the seizure stop, you could still have this on the EEG. So initial regression, that's when if the ESES has been going on for a while, let's say two to three years, you have a plateau in development as well. So child stops hitting the milestones and then starts to go down in terms of development. Some patients, if the seizure um, seizures get better controlled, then they may show some improvement. And most patients, they remain severely impaired. So this goes back to what I was saying that you have that window of time to intervene when they haven't had the cognitive impairment and then you can prevent the severe impairment. So why do children have CSWS? It's usually unknown um, in cases that are what we call non-lesional. So if there is no structural abnormality in the brain, then we look for reasons. That's why we look, we 
tend to do genetic testing on these children to find a reason for it. And there's also an association of CSWS with early developmental lesions of the brain. So um, early malformations, or for example, babies who've had a stroke, um, especially in the thalamus, then they can also have a higher propensity to have CSWS. And then there is this genetic associations. So when your epileptologist, for example, sends the epilepsy panel and they find mutations in these genes that I have listed here, sometimes it says variants of uncertain significance. But there has been associations with, for example, SCN2A with CSWS, KCNQ2, um, GRIN2A, SLC6A1. So the thought is these mutations are contributing to the CSWS. And then you can have recurrent copy number variants in different locations that I've listed here. So when you do get that result as well for either your chromosomal microarray or the epilepsy panel, and there are reports of these mutations, then bear in mind that perhaps um, the reason for the CSWS um, may be associated with these genetic mutations. Malformations of cortical development um, is pretty common, um, about 49.3% and 40.9% of two different cohorts of children who have um, CSWS had an early developmental lesion. So meaning a structural abnormality in the brain. And in patients with epilepsy, 100 per patients with ESES versus 47 patients without ESES. So they studied them side by side and they found that patients with ESES had a higher frequency of early developmental lesions. And also a higher frequency of thalamic lesions. You can, the child can also have vascular insults. So in a study of 32 patients with prenatal or perinatal thalamic lesions, sleep potentiation of epileptiform activity occurred in 29 cases. So that's pretty high, about 91%. 90 and this is just an example of an abnormal imaging of a child um, with a structural lesion in the brain as well. So this child had a stroke. So what do we do if we diagnose ESES on the EEG and we see these cognitive impairments, we see these behavioral problems, and so the child falls un under the continuous um, spike and wave syndrome spectrum? We do pharmacological treatment first. So one option is to do high dose benzodiazepine and then diazepam, lorazepam, clobazam. And if that does not help, so I typically do an EEG before I start treatment and then I start the treatment. And after about one to three months, I repeat the EEG, and I check for that spike wave index that we discussed before and see if there is a significant reduction in the spike wave index. If there is none, and also the child continues to have problems learning during the day, continues to have behavioral problems, then I consider starting, you can try the anticonvulsant drugs, ethosuximide, levetiracetam, these are levetiracetam or Keppra, that's usually my go-to. And then if that doesn't help either, then I do steroid treatment. So um, you could either, either do what we call a pulse steroid treat treatment. So you give steroids for so many number of days a month and you give that over three months or you do the long-term um, hydrocortisone treatment, the steroid treatment, which can sometimes last up to, nine, up to nine months. But then you have to consider the um, side effects as well of this treatment, such as 
hypertension, high blood pressure, and then they can also high, have high glucose, and then they can also have weight gain, or their behaviors can get worse as well. So I monitor um, the children that I put on steroids very closely. So if they respond to the steroids, then I do also an EEG about six months, four to six months after I stop the treatment with steroids. Because what sometimes happens is the ESES returns. They have, it goes away for about six months and then they return. So I check that. Uh, on the EEG as well. And I check how's the child doing at school? Um, how's the child, is the child able to do homework? Is your child learning? And if there is another regression, then I start looking for other things. I also start looking for a structural lesion. And we offer other options like IVIG, and there have been recent reports that some children do respond to ketogenic diet on this. So I have not specifically tried to treat a child with ESES with ketogenic diet. So I cannot speak to its efficacy, but I've had a patient who pretty much failed all these um, medications. And so we sent her for epilepsy surgery evaluation. We did an epilepsy surgery evaluation on her, and we found a lesion um, in her brain, a structural abnormality, and we were able to do phase two monitoring, which means we put in um, electrodes, depth electrodes in the brain to specifically look at the structural abnormality and to see if the seizures are coming from there or the ESES patterns also are coming from there. Hers was more focal. So we were able, it did support that, okay, it's coming, the lesion is probably where what we call the ictal onset zone, zone is, where the seizures are coming from. And so she, we've already tried all these other medicines. So we offered the epilepsy surgery option to the mother and, um, she agreed to it. And so she has been seizure free for two years. And her, she's doing well in school, um, even despite the COVID situation um, where she has to be homeschooled. The mother has noticed that she's able to pay attention more. Um, she's learning, she's, she's being mainstreamed now. So I think that if the other medications or treatments fail, then it's worth it to try to consider epilepsy surgery evaluation if there is a structural lesion that could be a target. So this is just a, a list of the data that we had for the efficacy of the different medications. So I do use Keppra. So in one study, seven out of 17 patients, about 41% responded to it. And I also use Clobazam. Six out of 19 patients or 31% um, responded to it. I haven't used Sulthanum. Um, steroids I have used. So 11 to seven out of 17%, 65% response. You do get that. And high dose diazepam, you get 37% response. <clears throat> but steroids note that all children had temporary respect, response. So six weeks to about four months. This is why I do the repeat EEG between four to six months. And according to this um, report from 2009, this publication, they, they talk about valproic acid, lamotrigine, topiramate, and ethosuximide as non-efficacious. So the duration of regression period is between two months and five years. So if they keep getting ESES on their EEG, then you can see their regression, excuse me, for about two months and five years. <clears throat> so 
there is a correlation between the length of the ESES period and extent of residual intellectual de deficit. <clears throat> so if the residual intellectual deficits in patients um, with, with an ESES period of less than 13 months, there's usually no deficits. That's why we get aggressive at treating it. And then you see that that deficit is greater than 18 months. So management, surgical management, you can have these different type of surgeries. What we did for my patient was we did, we did a lesionectomy. We found a structural lesion and the neurosurgeons went in and took it out. This is just a reminder of the spectrum that we see in ESES. And these are the benign focal epilepsy syndromes that can be associated with ESES. Note that the onset is um, a wide range from three to 14 years. And they can also have partial motor and sensory um, seizures. They can have tonic-clonic seizures. 80% um, of the ESES during sleep, and then sometimes some of these children actually have few clinical seizures. They can have less than 10. So that's why it takes a while sometimes to, for them to be evaluated. And then during the day when they come into the doctor, um, their neuro exam can be normal. And on the EEG, we do see these spikes in the central temporal region or sometimes they're happening on um, different sides, so bilateral independence. So it comes from one side and then it goes to the other side and then you see an increase in sleep. <clears throat> that ectal EEG, meaning the EEG during um, the ESES, they can have focal fast evolving to spikes and spike waves. So this is another example of an atypical benign epilepsy of childhood with central temporal spikes. So you see it also in every, almost in every second. So I would give this about a 90.9 um, spike wave index because you see here, it's not as pronounced as here. So there is one second where there is no um, spike. <clears throat> And then the landau kleffner syndrome, you can have the age-related epileptic encephalopathy, you have the language re regression as what I've mentioned, and then you can have the verbal agnosia. So you say something to them, um, they may not be able to say something back to you. Um, these children actually have infrequent seizures during the day. And then they can have an epileptic focus, meaning where the um, seizures are coming from in the centrotemporal region, centrotemporal, or posterior temporal, or parietal occipital back here. And this is an example of an EEG pattern in a landau kleffner syndrome ch child, um, in a five-year-old child with landau kleffner So this is awake, drowsy background. And then you see it starts Stage one sleep, you start to see these spike wave discharges. And then as soon as you go into non-REM sleep, you have this continuous spike wave. You can see that. So they have um, global cognitive decline. They can have the atonic seizures. They can have motor disturbances. And then the same thing as the previous one, for the benign epileptic um, syndromes, they can have seizures coming from the frontal central, frontal temporal, central temporal, and frontal regions of the brain. And this is just an example of a child with um, 
PSWS and an ESES pattern on EEG as well. You can see very busy. So in summary, ESES is an EEG pattern, CSWS is the syndrome, there is a window of opportunity for therapeutic intervention 12 to 18 months um, as soon as the ESES starts. So this is where um, the parents, you know your child very well, and so when they come to us and they talk about their child being extremely hyperactive, no longer learning, um, then, and of course, if they see, sometimes if they see seizures during the day also, I think it is worth doing a 24 hour video EEG to catch um, the child, to see the EEG pattern when the child goes through the different stages of sleep. And a longer duration of ESES may be associated with poor cognitive outcome. Behavioral abnormalities, particularly hyperactivity, are commonly present in children with ESES. So these are my references. Um, you could refer to them if you have any further questions. And the most, um, the latest one that I found was um, from the NCBI bookshelf. So you could access this online and you could just read through the a summary of the current information on ESES. Feel free to ask me any questions. I have, I have one question for you, actually. I think there's sure. your fourth slide where you said from two to three or two to four, it man, it like sh it shows up, and then six to nine, it could go away. The seizures, right, right. Um, and you said they lose like cognitive learning skills, and that's like almost permanent, right. So when you say permanent, can't they, won't they relearn that after they're nine years old? Like when they're, let's say they go, it's the seizure stop at nine, and then six years later at fifteen, won't they regain some of that and relearn those things? Or you're saying they're gone forever? What we have seen in the cohorts, meaning the patients who had ESES and were studied um, long-term, they don't regain it. So let's So it's say, permanent is what you're saying. Right, it's permanent, yes. Once you are past that window between two to, I, I expand the window, I say between two to four years of intervening, yes, they lose that. Thank you. Trying to find that slide for you. Yes, that one. Yes. And, so we, and, mm -hmm, and, and in EEGs, I mean, uh, I mean, my kid's been through, uh, he's had all sorts, 12 days, 24 hours, 48 hours, three days, seven days. He's been, he's had them all, but it's, is this obvious to most um, people that read EEGs that this would be a obvious diagnosis if they see an EEG? Because all his EEGs are clear. He has clear EEGs everywhere. I think he might have one, one <clears throat> blip on the radar, but he has, since he's been 11 months old and he's almost four and a half, he's had probably two dozen seizures only in sleep and within his first three hours of sleep. And it's usually either on the 90 minute mark or it's on like the two hour and 10 minute mark, like, I mean, like clockwork. Okay. And are they clinical seizures or are they EEG seizures? Meaning just on the EEG? Do you see? They don't anything? show up on the, they haven't, they haven't seen anything on an EEG yet. Okay. So how, who, um, who, what does he do that makes you think he has seizures during that 90 minute mark when he falls asleep? We, we, we have no idea. Like, I don't know what he does because we go back through his day and it's just like, you, you don't know, like, does he go to school and you think, oh, it's high activity. And then the next one months later is he's done nothing all day and laid around and mm -hmm. it's just, there's no, there's no pattern. 
I was just curious if if this mm -hmm. is obvious on an EEG to to many doctors. I I think it should it it's really um meaning it's really stark. You can really see it on the EEG just um, based on, for example, the pictures that I've shown you from the EEG. So unless you can see it here, right? And this one, you, will, you won't miss it. So if they review um, the whole time that he's asleep, and they don't see this pattern, then it may not be ESES because it's very hard to miss this pattern. Right, I figured as much. I mean, he just right. he regresses, like he had one when he was like, I don't know, two, a couple years ago. And mm -hmm. he just learned like his ABCs and then he had one and then it takes two weeks for it to come back. Mm -hmm. He's like the two to three week mark that comes back. But as he's grown older, um, he does Topamax and that sort of helped him. He doesn't really regress. I mean, he, he hasn't really had one since he's been on Topamax for about almost a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, he, it's, it's very interesting. Okay. Well, I hope that, um, you know, have a discussion with your epileptologist again, and maybe they can consider doing genetic testing to see if he has any- We're already um, going through that. You've already gone. Has we're, anything we're come back? December 4th. December, okay. Out. So that might be helpful. Any other questions or comments? Yes, I was just wondering um, if a patient has ESES, um, would they have it every time they're asleep or could it happen just sometimes? Usually it's, so this is why we do the scoring and we try to do the score um, on the same segment of sleep. So sometimes, you know, sometimes it may not show up right away but if you look at the same stage of sleep every time, let's say let's say we do an EEG for five days and then they fall asleep at 10, 10 p.m. And usually I start seeing it at around 11, between 11 to 12. And then from 12 to two, you could really see it just running. So the next night, you look at it again between 12 to two, and then you would still, you could see the ESES. Okay. So, right. So you have to look at it in the same stage of sleep. Okay, so for instance, my daughter, she is, um, she's three years old and she wakes, it seems that she has this pattern where she's waking up at night um, one night and then she'll sleep the whole night, like the next night, and then the next night she'll sleep the whole night, and then and then she'll wake up like three or four times the next night. So would that be indicative that she might have ESS? I mean, we haven't yet had a chance to do another EEG. What did the first EEG look like? What what did they tell you? What it did they find? She didn't have EEG, EES, yes, at that time. She didn't have ES, yes. Has she continued to have these regression? Um, well, the thing is, she's already very delayed. Um, mm -hmm. And she's three years old. And so I don't know necessarily if it's a regression or if she's plateaued or I, I, I don't know. I mean, because she's so young, I don't know. And she's already really delayed. I don't know if she's going to regress even more. Okay. I think without seeing her EEG, I will not be able to give you any input, but it will be worth, um, it may be worth repeating it and seeing what it looks like now and compare it from before. Yeah, we have another EEG coming up um, at the end of this week, so uh, hopefully we'll get some answers, but I was just wondering if 
because some nights she sleeps really well and then other nights she's waking up three or four times getting out of bed and I, I just don't know what it means. And mm -hmm. When she wakes up, do you see any seizures? No. No, okay. But her seizures are very, very subtle, so it's very easy to miss them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So certainly um, you can, they can do another EEG and compare it with the previous one. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Can you have ADN FLE with this too? So that's a very good question. Um, ADFNLE is an entity on its own. So that's usually associated with a certain um, genetic abnormality. That genetic abnormality is not listed in the ones that are associated with ESES. So I would, um, Stick with the ADFNLE diagnosis if there is supportive um, genetic mutations supporting ADFNLE. And then um, the ES, calling ESES on top of ADFNLE has been debated by different epileptologists because they think that um, if the seizures are really bad, um, during sleep due to ADF, ADF and LE, then it's not, it can't be ESES. So remember, it's called electrical status epilepticus in sleep. So electrical, it's, you see it on the EEG. They don't have the classic ADF and LE seizures, which um, wakes them up <coughs> to sleep. They can have tonic seizures, meaning the stiffening, and then they go into clonic seizures. So there is a clinical seizure associated with ADF and LE. For ESES, it's an EEG seizure. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. It just my one, my children have, I have two of them with AD and FLE, and they both oh. have learning disabilities mm -hmm. along with it. My youngest has autism with the intellectual disability. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I, I take care of, um, I have a special interest in autism as well as epilepsy. And I do different modalities for my patients with both autism and epilepsy. So with the epilepsy, of course, I treat them med with medications and certain medications that help with their epilepsy can also help with their autistic behaviors. Mm -hmm. So if I have to, and if it's not contraindicated, for example, some of my patients with autism and epilepsy respond well to valproic acid in terms of their behavior to calm them down. And okay. I have seen that some of them who are on Risperdal, um, somehow it actually also helps control their seizures in conjunction with other anti-seizure medicines. So anything that can help them, then my, the parents and I, um, you know, we work together and we keep those medications that help them. So ABA therapy is very helpful for a lot of my patients with autism. Um, is your child on carbamazepine? Actually, right now, my children are doing a, um... A study we started at December 21st with mm -hmm. nicotine because okay. they have a mutation right now. Mm -hmm. um, they have mutations, the CHRNA4, mm -hmm. um, which is a nicotine mutation. Mm -hmm. And my children went from having six to 36 seizures a night per child down to none. Oh, that's great. Yeah. that's great. Yeah. And because of that, we found that they now can. Um, focus and do things that they couldn't do prior. Mm -hmm. That's great news. That's good. Yeah. So this is where genetic testing is very helpful in terms of what we can offer families. 
an option. Yeah, I learned that from last year when I went to the conference about genetic testing and how important it was and learned some of this and took it back to our doctors and fought them and won to get them to do the nicotine trial on my kids. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sorry to say, but we're going to have to kind of wrap this up. Um, finish okay, this. that's good news. Thank you so much, Dr. Chong. It was awesome. A lot of information. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Will Thank you. Will some of this be um, available to be able to see some of the slides? I missed about the first half because of kids. Um, will, or is it being presented again? Come on in um, later on and um, watch the all the all the talks. Oh, perfect. Okay. Thank okay. you. All righty. Have a good day. Great day, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Great job.